Hi there, my name's Oshin Dunny and welcome to Audio Talks, presented to you by Harman. And in this episode, we're going to explore the art and tech of cinematic sound, what it is, why it matters, and how to get it in your home. And I am thrilled to be joined by two legendary experts for this panoramic overview of the silver screen and its important sonics. Bobette Buster is a master storyteller, TED Talker, author of How to Tell Your Story So the World Listens, the writer and producer of Making Waves, The Art of Cinema Sound, and holds senior educational roles at Tufts University, Northeastern University, and the University of Southern California. Welcome to the podcast, Bobette. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Great to have you here, Bobette. And joining this power duo is Soren Mylund, the Senior Director of Sales for Strategic Partnerships and Business Development, EMEA, at Harman. He's also a historic sound equipment collector, a secret sound museum curator, and a big time lover of great audio. Welcome, Soren. Thank you very much, Royce, and thank you for having me. Great to have you here. Okay, so this is the first question, and I'm looking at your good self, Babette. Um, you know, because I watched your wonderful film recently. It is so educational. It's really a journey through the history of cinematic sound, cinematic audio. And uh, I just wanted to take it back to the very beginning. What was the impact of the first synchronized recorded soundtrack with human dialogue on the cinema industry? It was convulsive. It was overwhelming. <laughs> now, I would like to say that it was right at the time that radio was happening. Yeah. And uh, radio, at the, and we have to take ourselves back to that era in which people were used to going to events and having great stentorian speakers speak in a loud <laughs> voice to a large crowd because they didn't have microphones. And they would speak on for two hours, whatever, hold forth in meadows, whatever, and people would be well-dressed. And when radio came in the first time, live, of course, no recording, there was a man in New York City named Roxy, who was sort of a vaudeville star, and he came on and he was very folksy, and he said at the end of his little chat live, he said, good night, uh, good luck, and God bless. And... There was an outcry by thousands of people writing in saying that was disrespectful, that was too casual. And so the fledgling newborn Federal Communications Commission uh, fined Roxy and the station. Now, Roxy is the name of a lot of movie theaters named after him, but it was considered a scandal until they realized, people realized, oh, we can hear regular voices? And there was a famous vaudeville star of Will Rogers, who is an Oklahoma cowboy, very folksy satirist. He would be a great sort of uh, Saturday Night Live comedian today because he was also a political satirist, which was unheard of. And he would come in in this, ah, shucks, Oklahoma voice. And people weren't used to this casual homegrown sound. It wasn't proper English or proper uh, speaking. So at the same time in movies, they had been experimenting with music and they had different music experiences happening and trying to capture the audience's imagination. And if you see the first film, The Jazz Singer, it is actually partially uh, in black and white. You'll see cards, which was very much the norm, had been for over 25 years to see a film and then it was a shift to a visual of, of what the action is. And then it was meant to go into Al Jolson singing. He, he, came, he was a, the son of a, a rabbi who uh, sung, of course, in the synagogue. And, and yet he was tortured and was torturing his mother because he also was a jazz singer. And in the middle of the performance, he literally said on camera, wait a minute, wait a minute, you ain't heard nothing yet. And when the audience in the, in the theater heard that, they erupted because they could hear authentic human speech. And it was the vernacular of the day, you know, and it was also hip, you know, that kind of lingo that he was speaking. Uh, yes, he does later on put on blackface and he sings Mammy and all that. What, we, what was the breakthrough was the voice. And that's why they're called talkies. And that became the form. Everybody wanted to make 
a talkie, and that was the, you know, they had a hundred million write down of all these silent movies within a year in Hollywood because nobody would go to see silent movies anymore. And then they had to invent a way to bring talkies into the movies. Wow. That's incredible. And, and Soren, we were actually talking recently about this moment of Al Jolson coming on the screen saying those immortal words. And this was captured in a film recently, I believe. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. In the film Babylon with Brad Pitt. It is for the, the silent movie era. And, uh, and this is also a reference point for us uh, within JBL that we are uh, always talking about that in 1927, the Lansing Manufacturing Company was uh, was helping delivering the drivers for that theater and uh, that system. So, uh, yes. So for us, it is actually, you know, turning around that 100 years later, more or less, it is actually featured also in that film. So it's super, super cool and very interesting. Oh, that's phenomenal. I didn't realise that about the drivers. Now, many listeners will be familiar with the term driver, but it's another word for speaker. It's that, those kind of things that sit behind the screens and, you know, make the sound come out. That's a scientific explanation anyway. But, Bob Head, coming back to yourself now, you are a master storyteller. You, you write amazing books and films. What did this moment mean with the addition of dialogue, you know, and soundtracks and synchronised soundtracks? What did it mean for the art of cinematic storytelling? Well, you also have to remember that there was this little known uh, three times bankrupt animator named Walt Disney, who uh, had, an, you know, kept going out of business, but had this great passion. In those days, to get across America, he had a little studio right where I live, near here in Hollywood, California, with his partner, I work, they created this uh, rabbit, Oswald Rabbit, animated. And took it to New York City to premiere. It took three full days by train. And uh, Walt carried the reel all the way to New York City. And when the audience saw it on the big screen, and Walt bet the ranch, he bet all of his money on this little animated rabbit, the audience saw it and went crazy on this animation. And the owner, who had paid Walt and Ub to make it, said, all right, I got it now, you're fired. And he took the rabbit animation, thinking that was it, needed no more. And Walt went home devastated across America, had to change trains in Chicago. And then out of the ashes, like the phoenix, he thought, well, he's got the rabbit, I'm going to create a mouse. So he goes to Ub Iwerks, even though they're dead broke, with their wives into a garage, create, Ub puts together this little thing of Steamboat Willie, Amazing. and they decide to create a soundtrack. And then Steamboat Willie is whistling, and they yes. actually create all this sound, you know, and they have banging drums and, and clanging cymbals. He goes back to New York with... Steamboat Willie, and that was the eruption that you could hear sound with animation. So animation really came alive with sound. And this was all happening in like the same year, same year that Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic, these convulsive new ways of experiencing the world. It was a time of sort of mind-blowing uh, modernity. Amazing. Wow, what a, what a time. And uh, you, you captured that very well. I mean, what do you think this new language of synchronised speech and audio and visuals meant in terms of the audience experience? It, it kind of was something new and exciting. Well, OK, so there was a race and it was very much a format war. Actually, it was William Fox himself had gotten a patent out of Germany for putting actual sound on film, which, of course, later on became the the format, but it was the Warner Brothers who had created the synchronized sound with a separate playing phonograph, which, of course, soon had its own issues because, you know, the records kept cracking or you couldn't sync them up properly or you couldn't really transport them. It was very, very tedious and difficult. But the Warner Brothers were first to get a story into the marketplace that captivated the audience. Now, it's important to know there were four Warner Brothers. The one Warner Brother who made this happen, he was determined to be the first, died of a heart attack the night before the opening. He was so overworked. I mean, that's how much of a pressure it was. 
So once Warner Brothers had sort of won the, you know, the race, they went right into production. And of course, nobody could figure out really how to capture sound and put it on the set. As we know, there are famous stories of the sound booths and the floating boom camera uh, operator and all that. So they created gangster movies. And so James Cagney, also the very first public enemy, was half viewing cards and half voice. Now, here's the thing. His voice was the vernacular of a gangster. And again, that was as provocative as showing nudity. Like, you know, this wow. end, at the very end, when he is killed, I think he said something like, as he's dying, mother of God, help me. And he dies. You know, so he gets his just desserts. Catholic Church came out and said, you cannot invoke the name of the mother of God. How dare you? So they had to sort of work over that to it sort of became mother help me. And so there was this general outcry that it was too frank. It was too in your face that it was going to corrupt morals. But at the same time, it was terribly tantalizing. Who didn't want to go to a movie and hear the gangsters talk? So there's the ubiquitous stories, of course, of all the silent screen stars who had terrible voices and they lost their careers. You know, the men with the high pitched voices. So the big issue ultimately became that in the actual recording and putting it down to a film was the hiss. Mm -hmm. And what were they going to do with the hiss in the scenes? And that's when they started creating the music overlay, which to me, when I hear old movies now, you're either hearing the hiss, like Greta Garbo, it's yeah. hissing constantly, <laughs> or you hear wall-to-wall -wall music. There's no relief. My goodness. That, that's phenomenal. It, I've had no idea that was the reason behind this kind of a constant wall of music in a lot of those old movies. That's absolutely brilliant. Now, uh, Søren, coming back to yourself, now th the first cinemas were, you know, they had JBL drivers in there, or Lansing drivers, and uh, it was kind of very early doors, but the amplifiers were pretty kind of, you know, they were like three watts valve amplifiers. Yeah, yeah. They didn't have much in terms of projecting the sounds to all, you know, 1,500 seats in the audience. But this is really the beginning of the, the JBL story in terms of their partnership with one of the big movie theatres. Talk to us a bit about what happened next. With the MGM, and especially this is uh, early 30s, where James B. Lansing is being asked to really develop a better uh, cinema system. And this is for the MGM, as mentioned. And, and that's exactly where the Sierra Horn, which is also one of the milestones for us, is placed. And for the first time, really a cinema system that can cover us from 10 kilohertz or all the way down to 40 hertz, you know. So this is wow. new and also something that we are very proud of mentioning, where we are winning the Technical Achievement Award at the Academy. And that's in, I think, 1930. Wow. So this is uh, this is really where the Lansing manufacturing company really starts developing fast. There's a couple of scaled down versions. It is a beautiful piece, of course, but it's also not maybe something that you're thinking of. Would you like to have that at home in a small scale? And that's why later on, also in the late 30s, the iconic series is being developed. And, and then more or less... The rest is history, but it is uh, definitely the Sierra Horn that we are so proud also talking about. Wow. So, so that was yeah. kind of like the early kind of tech breakthrough in terms yes. of cinema, sound, amplification, and yes. kind of sharing it with a room full of captivated people, you know, going crazy over this kind of amazing new format. And this was sort of the beginning of the road for the whole James B. Lansing story. The iconic series came on the back of the Shiro horn, but then mm -hmm. that kind of kept rolling. The momentum kept going. I heard it saying that cinema sound made JBL and JBL made cinema sound. What kind of happened next for JBL and this trajectory? Well, it's the cinema sound is the beginning, but again, then you can also do the, the major stage sound and developing further on within the, the 40s and the 50s, there's still this demand of speakers uh, and it's still very much focused on the cinema sound. But as soon as we are moving more into the 50s, there's also the bringing it home, you know, bringing the audio home and invest in uh, nice speakers uh, in your living rooms. And also for us, it's again, jumping into the 60s. Another milestone that we also love talking about, of course, is uh, 69 Woodstock. This is where we see, you know, the incredible states filled with the JBL speakers. But it is absolutely uh, developing into a continuation of where we are today. We've seen with a lot today, JBL is dominant in the market also, of course, with the portables and headphones and, and so forth. But going back, 
It is definitely the the cinema sound later on, the wonderful stereo setups with JBL. Mm, fantastic, yeah. yes. Babette? Yeah, I think if the audience could remember, uh, there was part of the incentive to get people to go to the movies in the 30s. Of course, it was Depression era was each of the studios built these phenomenal movie palaces, and they were huge. And, you know, you would walk into another worldly landscape of painted ceilings and, you know, uh, extraordinary design inside. So if you're sitting in the balcony and, you know, it's a 1,500-seat theater and there's one speaker coming out, that speaker <laughs> has to come out into the entire room Unfortunately, then the decay of the movie-going audience started happening, it continued into the 50s and 60s, and the distributors, the actual movie owner, palace owners, you know, were breaking up, and they were making them much smaller, sort of shower stall kind of compartmentalization, and um, a great frustration to, I remember Walter Murch said, they were still using the same mono speaker out front when The Godfather came out. But it was rock and roll that was forcing the industry to wake up in movies. The movie studio, the distributors had no incentive to improve the audience experience. They were simply, we provide the theater. It was very arrogant. They didn't even care about the viewing experience. But in rock and roll, they were growing with the audience's appetite for sound. And the fact that you could have a stereo at home and you could listen in a, an enclosed environment, just created a demand for better audience participation. So it was rock and roll that led. 100%, yeah. Amazing. And you mentioned Walter Murch there, the absolutely legendary sound designer from The Godfather for starters, and just was one of the people who wrote the book on sound design and uh, interviewed extensively in your film, Babette, which is so entertaining. And you also mentioned the arrival of stereo there. And you had a great chat with Barbara Streisand in the film about how she had to really personally push and invest for the studio that she was working with to actually invest in stereo sound for her film, A Star is Born. Talk to us a bit about that moment. Well, again, the, the studio owners were arrogant. They said, the sound does not matter. And here we had this whole new generation of talent, George Lucas, Stanley Kubrick, Terrence Malick, and Barbara Streisand. Those were the leaders. And they were coming up out of music. And of course, Barbara's coming out of the performing space. And they were saying, this is not enough. The audience wants more. And in, Francis Ford Coppola and George Lucas both said, sound is 50% of the experience. And there were very famous arguments with studio executives saying, I don't want to cuss on your show, but really <laughs> frank language <laughs> saying that is essentially meaningless to them. They had no desire to improve the sound experience. All that mattered was that they provided seats in the theater. Then the audience be damned, really. And so it was Barbara, because of her legendary stardom and fame, and of course she was a perfectionist, who heard that, oh, you mean I can affect the audience's experience? She herself invested her own money up to like $6 million, and she had the very first long mix, like six, eight weeks. It was legendary throughout the, you know, the industry, how long people were getting a chance to make and, and build the tracks and mix the experience of stadium quality experience. She wanted people to feel like, what is it like to be in a big arena experiencing the quality and all the range of sounds? That was very important to her. And uh, they, she kept being told, it's your money, Barbara, it's your money. And as soon as it was done, uh, and it tested brilliantly, the studio was like, okay, okay, we get it. And uh, <laughs> But they had to be dragged by talent. And the same thing yeah. happened with George Lucas with his little film, Star Wars. He and his producing partner, Gary Kurtz, they wanted to record in stereo and on set and again, push back from everybody. And of course, George was much maligned by his crew in the first uh, making of Star Wars. And nevertheless, they pressed on. And it was George's frustration with the audience's experience. He said, I want the audience 
to experience what we experience on the big stage. It is so profound, the layers uh, that go into this, the artistry. And so that's why he took his money and created THX Sound. And he dragged the industry into a whole new era of listening. And I remember he had these great things that as soon as his logo came on THX and you could hear the sound shift in the cinema, the actual slogan was the audience is listening. So it was these filmmakers who said, we care about the audience experience. Whereas now, you know, you see a lot of the movie owners, they're spending their money on the seats or do they recline? They have these extraordinarily elaborate concession stands, but they're making no concession to the audience and making them cheaper or more inviting. And the audience simply wants to go and be immersed into the story universe. That's what they want. And if they can get that at home, by God, they'll get it at home. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, and, and Surin, like the THX story is quite interesting because I believe that was another moment where the kind of background of JBL overlapped with this kind of historic arc of progress in cinema audio. Sure. Um, t- talk to us a bit about that that kind of partnership. THX was uh, 1983, right? And it, it's George Lucas. And we had a preferred partnership with him on building these cinemas with very powerful amplification and uh, compression drivers, which became a part of the standard of the THX standard. And then, of course, the subwoofers. So you can really have the surround sound with the THX. And it really started there. I know that Francis Ford Coppola and uh, Apocalypse now is is also on this earlier than that because it's the late 70s, right? And it's with the sixth track and uh, the way that they recorded this uh, it was a completely new way of audio in cinemas. But we love very much talking also about, of course, the TA6 certification and, and the importance. And this is what we talk about every day, the importance of good audio from uh, wherever you are enjoying your audio. It's on the go or at home or at the festivals, concerts, et cetera, et cetera. So for us, it's uh, THX is something that really makes me happy that it's about time that the audio in the movie theaters was really uh, was really to a certain standard. And if you don't have a THX standard, you, you basically didn't want to go there because it was the place to go to really enjoy. And I like this, that it's 50%, the audio is 50% of, uh, of the experience. Love it. And as our founder, Dr. Sidney Harman of uh, Harman International, he said, yeah, the the movie is in in beautiful colors, but why should the audio be in black and white? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Amen. And that's how we have been taught uh, that this uh, we cannot have. And that's why it's so important with uh, with the good sound. I want to say here that the executives, the people, the money men, who were in charge were always dragging their feet for improvements, uh, you know, as is typical. It was the creatives. So George Lucas and Barbara Streisand and others who said, no. And I mean, it was Francis Ford Coppola who said, I want surround sound. And he was the one who uh, sort of commissioned Walter Merge and his team, Mark Berger and Richard Beggs, and they invented what we now is the ground standard of 5.1 surround sound. And he said, we will build the theater. If people have to come to us in Kansas City, in the middle of the United States, as they come to hear <laughs> Wagner in Germany, in the best conditions, that's what we will do. They must hear the sound in its best condition. And he was driving the whole sound story. So it's a case where technology was there and the creatives could see it and they were forcing technology to the next level and technology was ready. Mm -hmm. And it was this extraordinary partnership of once the people who could be unleashed with their technological prowess to be creative, then you had a whole explosion of creativity happening. And then the audience is sitting back and saying, yes, I want more. 100%. That was the whole ecosystem that they drove and created. It, we would still be in mono sound, little tiny theaters, if it was just left to the powers that be. 
I hear that. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Viva the revolution. Viva the creatives. Thank you for the pioneers. And, you know, folks, if you haven't watched Bobette's film, Making Waves, we're going to put a link in the show notes. I really recommend you check it out. It goes behind the scenes and speaks with the sound designers, the pioneers in in Apocalypse Now. Uh, You know, chats with Barbara Streisand herself, chats with George Lucas and, you know, pretty much everybody, everybody who's been involved in this kind of whole creative revolution around cinema sound is in that film and it really tells a story very succinctly. It's very much worth watching. So um, coming on to the modern day, we're in the digital age. We've got the internet, we've got artificial intelligence providing mixing tools and we've got non-destructive editing and really an infinite number of sound design tracks. So Bubba, how do you think that professionals deal with this sheer complexity of modern cinema sound production? Is it very different or kind of is it you know, the same as it's always been? Well, it's always still creative. I mean, it's like we now, you know, it used to, when I grew up, you know, we had a box of crayons that were 60 colors. And even then it was like a torture. What shade of blue am I going to (laughs) color, you know, Cinderella's dress? Is it uh, blue, green, green, blue, whatever. That's 60. Now it's a, a million pixels of color, but it's still the creative choices. You have a lot of tools in front of you. But it still depends on the artist's choices. Now, the the exciting thing about digital is the ability to edit and to mix right in front of you. And you've actually democratized the process so people can learn how to use the tools at a much younger age and experiment and, and be empowered to be more creative. And I think that is very exciting. What is difficult, I think, is... For example, we recorded our documentary in 5.1 sound, but in many places it's only available in regular stereo sound or people are listening just on a simple speaker on their iPhone or their, unless they have very good headphones or they're not hearing the complexity of the sound design. Here it is a documentary on sound and we can't depend on the technology to deliver the experience that we so carefully wanted people to hear. Mm -hmm. And I think that the more the technology around us is of a certain level, then we want to live in that level. Yes. Uh, You know, it's like now we expect that when we go into certain places, we're going to have running water. We're going to have a certain level of comforts heat or air conditioning or whatever. We're not going to live as we once lived unless we choose to have the more rugged experience. And I think once people have ears to hear, that's what they want. And uh, Bobette, zooming out a little bit here, how would you describe the impact of cinema sound on the world? Walter Murch asked this very important question that he heard from a Hungarian whose name I don't remember. And who wrote an essay in the 1930s when cinema sound was starting, to, you know, taking over the world. He said, is it possible that sound in cinema is teaching us to hear the world differently? And so Walter Murch became sort of the philosopher king of analyzing what happened when we unleashed sound by recording and understood multi-tracks and understood mixing that we were actually creating, unleashing sort of the dancing shadow to have its own power force. So sound, as we know it, is a 20th century phenomenon. Before that, sound was seen as like perfume. It was ineffable. You couldn't capture it. It just, you know, wafted by you, you know. You went to live performances of music, you know. Mm -hmm. And then when Thomas Edison, who was partially deaf, created the phonograph, That was the electrifying moment that you could capture sound apart from anything. And so at the end of his life, Thomas Edison was asked, you know, he had over a thousand inventions, you know, he was the man, the great inventor. And they said, what was your most important invention? And without missing a beat, he said the phonograph. Yeah, absolutely phenomenal. Fantastic. So and coming back to your good self, now we've you know, been talking about this exquisite art of sound design, uh, you know, the art form of cinematic storytelling. It is one of the great art forms of humanity. It kind of can do something to our emotions that very few other experiences can. 
like how best do we honour this on the other side of things with the technology, with the speakers, with the kind of home experience, with the cinema experience? You know, what would you kind of say about this parallel track in which the technology industry has to move in line with the art and really honour it in the best way where people are and wherever they are? You are, as also Bobet was was saying, you are becoming more picky. The, the best cinema in, uh, in Scandinavia is actually in Copenhagen, Imperial, you know, and when you really want to see the new movies, you go there yeah. because that's a thousand or eleven hundred seater cinema. And with all the new technology and the Atmos system from JBL and the full size, this is because you have tried it and then you can't step down. You can't go to a little movie theater over there that also maybe have some kind of okay ish system, but you know how good it really can be. Then you go after it, you go for it. And that's one aspect that. The technology within Cinema Sound is developing and uh, and together, of course, with all the variations of Dolby THX over the years. And, of course, in combination with the great JBL speakers. But also, you take it from there and you want to maybe take it with you home. That's also for convenience. Now you can see everything, all movies, more or less, on streaming services at home. And again... I remember when we when we spoke last time, also we, we talked about that we have lost a full generation of young people because they were listening to music through that little tiny speaker right oh, there. Yeah. 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 What a shame because let's educate them that this is uh, really important. If you want to, if you want to listen to music and it's uh, by convenience, please then invest just a tiny bit to get a speaker at a certain level, you know, so you can uh, listen to it, how it was actually made. And same thing we, we talk about when you bring the movies home, you know, from the very first AVRs, you bought the analog audio video receivers. Let's do this uh, correctly. And then, all right, this is, uh, this is the cinema sound. Not completely as it is in the cinema, but very close to you get the feeling of the surround sound and so forth. And when the digital age came in inside the the AVRs and so forth, mid late nineties, it was uh, it was completely different, you know. And and again, it was not cheap. Of course, you can get uh, cheap variations of this, but there has always been a difference there. Uh, I remember perfectly when we we launched, uh, and this is way before something is called the sound bar. Was in the, there was these small compact systems where, where with a heavy, heavy power amplification inside built into a subwoofer. And I remember we were educating the, the store owners how to set it up, you know, and there was one movie we always choose at the time. And this is before the DVDs. So we were actually very proud of the stereo VHS and Independence Day. You know, the opening scene of Independence Day, 20th century frogs, you know, the letters are coming up and then it's <laughs> behind you. It's amazing. <laughs> and that was, the, that was uh, the first home cinema systems, more or less in a box. Uh, wow. Educating. Yes, you can actually bring the good cinema sound home. Yeah, indeed. Well, the JPL has that kind of through line from the big screens and, you know, the, the, the theatre at the Academy it, itself, you know, it's a very busy place recently uh, with the Oscars. And then also they do the JBL synthesis, which a lot of those, you know, uh, kind of very well-known directors have at home. We can't name who they are, but some of them may or may not be in Bobette's amazing film. And that's their kind of like home cinema setup. And then the democratisation kind of continues as the technology gets better and better. And we, we have now these new sound bars. You can just put them in front of your TV, t- detach these little speakers and then set up surround sound and Dolby sound and Atmos and everything. And you're kind of sitting there at home with the best sound you've ever had in your house yeah. at a price level that is fairly democratised. That is really brilliant. Because I think this ties into what we were talking about with the uh, increasing popularity of the streaming services. You know, Bobette, it, it seems a bit like, you know, we've got the streaming giants at home and we've got video on demand and all of that is just going through the roof. And as Soren says, people are demanding a better experience at the kind of... They would like to hear what the director hears and the sound designer hears. But what are your thoughts on what this means for the future of actually cinematic venues? You know, do you think it's kind of going towards luxury in one area and then going towards home in another area? Or how do you think it's going to pan out? I think that the lockdown really created a great divide. And mm-hmm. we're in a state of free fall and crisis in the cinema industry right now. And uh, maybe the big superhero 
action films, you know, horror films like Scream or Mm -hmm. the latest Marvel comic or Top Gun Maverick, they can draw an audience in for that great big communal Mm -hmm. experience. But for the range of storytelling that is possible, family films, Pixar, art house cinema, people will say, I'll stay at home because it's available to me anytime, anywhere. I can Mm -hmm. stream it. I want to be in the comforts of my home. Plus, Netflix now is fearlessly backing very long movies. So you don't want to go to see a three-hour All Quiet on the Western Front in a movie theater because Netflix is fearlessly saying, you just put it on pause if you want to go to the bathroom. Hey, go to the, you know, if you want some, you know, you can go get your, pour yourself a coffee or a drink, you know. They don't care. Whereas the movie theaters really understood that the audience could only sit for a certain period of time. Plus, Mm -hmm. they wanted people in and out so they could get three screenings a night, you know, and they wanted to make their money on the popcorn. Now the audience is saying, I want this in my control. I want to eat what I want, drink what I want. I want to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. So the audience is saying, we can get it the way we want it now. You listen to us. So all of the movie theater corporations, the actual like AMC and those, they filed for bankruptcy, they're restructuring, they're trying to figure out their new game plan. They've only made their popcorn more expensive. I do not understand that. And you go to those big experience theaters for the big joint group experience. Now, there truly is nothing like seeing a movie with a huge room full of people. Yes. They have done lots of studies on... A film is funnier if there's at least 400 people in the room. You get more scared if there are more people in the room. You have this electric, it's like a murmuration of birds, this emotional electrification. You know, you watch something, remember back in the day when Jaws happened and it jumped, people would go to be in the room, you know. And the very first day or opening weekend of certain movies, those of us who love movies, we want to be with the people in the room. There's nothing like that joint experience it's like a rock concert right or why do people in wisconsin in america when in january when it's a blizzard want to sit next to each other fifty thousand people in a stadium and watch a live football game they want the group experience there will always be that but i think now the audience is saying i will choose that uh as a specialty in my life not as a norm And that is the difference. And I don't know that the movie theaters can maintain a business when people are saying selectively, I'll go two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. I want my home to be the comfortable entertainment place. I think the real education right now, it to me, is getting women, if I might speak to my gender, to appreciate sound like men do. I think that, would you agree? You do agree? (laughs) Strong agree. I do. Women are in a different bandwidth. I speak to myself. I remember having boyfriends who were just so convulsed with their speakers and their subwoofers. And I thought, what are they talking about? (laughs) And it being just this, you know, incredible passion. And they had all their albums, you know, alphabetized and lined up and you couldn't touch you know, the, 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 you know, but be so careful with it all, right? Whereas women just want the experience. Mm. They want to sit down and be comfortable and settled. And once women realize that it can be a pleasure to be in a sound universe that is complex, it's coming at you from different levels that you can hear the layers of it, then there will be no going back because yes. they are the ones who will commit. That is so spot on, Bobette. You're absolutely right. I've never heard anyone share exactly that view before, but that makes complete sense. And Soren, this is kind of good news from the point of view of the soundbar experience. One cable, power on, and uh, there it is. Yes, uh, we are going for unique, slim designs. And then again, never compromise the, uh, the physics uh, of, uh, of the size. Uh, the digital sound processing can help a lot with the phenomenal uh, audio. And again, we, we build everything from bottoms up simply. We have the fantastic engineering department sitting uh, around the globe, really. Uh, wow. Now, I speak as a man who has, for decades, had boxes of old cables, and I keep them just in case they might come in handy. I've still got like... Uh, <laughs> 
scuzzy <laughs> cables and video. Like, it's just crazy. I know it's crazy, but I can't bring myself to throw them out. But the thing I like about the new soundbars, you get them out of the box, stick them down, you kind of press a button and it, it figures out the dimensions yeah. of your room. Yes. And it adjusts for the dimensions of the room so it can bounce the sound off your walls and ceilings towards your ears and kind of do it in such a way with directional speakers that you're getting a full immersive 360 Atmos, Dolby yeah. Atmos sound. And it blows my mind. You know, I can throw away my box of wires finally. Uh, it's very good news for everyone. And Bobby, exactly like you say, you know, I don't know any women who have a box of cables. Uh, although I'm sure there are. <laughs> well, I have them, but I don't know what to do with them. They sit there. And... <laughs> Fantastic. Well, good to meet a fellow traveler. I would say that for women, uh, this is true for uh, movies in Hollywood. Yes. That action movies are always a phenomenon developed for young males, 15 to 35. To actually have a breakthrough movie you have to bring in the women who do not normally go out opening weekend unless they've heard a buzz. Mm. So for women, and then once they commit to the story, they give the best word of mouth. Now, what I've seen in so far as like understanding sound, which is where it broke through for me, was understanding and immersing myself into a story and hearing the layers of how the story sound created greater compassion for the character. It created an aha. I could hear the background dialogue meant something. And all of a sudden, I was deeply committed to the sound design because the story was leading me in my mind in a different direction from sound. Yes, And it was profound once I had that sort of aha moment. There were several movies uh, when I experienced that one being The Birds from Hitchcock, which, you know, I was a young child. I saw that on television mm -hmm. and it blew my mind. And I little did I know that Hitchcock was a pioneer in sound storytelling. And then Rear Window, which had so many layers of sound design with the music, the background uh, happening, uh, all to tell the inner thoughts revealed of Jimmy Stewart and his growing love and attachment for the beautiful Grace Kelly and his fear she would be murdered. And then on to David Lynch's masterful Elephant Man with Adrian Lyne. Once I surrendered to the viewing experience of that film, which is a masterpiece in sound design, yes. I said, there's something else going on here. That's when I committed to make this movie. That's when I went out and said, we have to have a documentary because people don't understand this. It takes too long to raise their consciousness. Mm -hmm. So if I can at least in an hour and a half explain why this is important, that's why we have to have the movie. Phenomenal. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad you went on that journey. It's such an informative film. It is linked in the show notes. Anybody listening, I really do recommend you make it your business to, to watch the entire thing. And um, speaking of, you know, you've just kind of mentioned a few wonderful films there. I'm sure people are going to be adding them to their watch list or their watch list to revisit. Um, I'm going to ask a final question to both of you, and that is to choose a track for our Audio Talks title playlist. Now, this can be from your favourite soundtrack, your favourite moment of a movie, or just something that means uh, that's important to you. Um, and I'm going to come to your good self first, Bobette. Well, it's like asking me about my favourite child. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would say probably the most dramatic breakthrough sound design moment for me was The Godfather. Uh, when Michael Corleone, played by Al Pacino, must decide if he's going to murder Salazzo and the Irish cop. And here he is, the all-American hero. The, you know, he has a big plan to go become governor, maybe president, and marry the beautiful Kay Adams. He's going to be the civilian Corleone. So if he kills them, that American dream is over. And so this happens halfway through the film. And he is in agony in the restaurant. And all you can hear off screen is the screeching of an elevated train going around the track. You don't see it. But it's really his mind screeching. He's like agonizing. Should I? Should I? Can I kill them? What can I do? And as soon as he chooses, yes, I must, and he kills them, the sound goes to silence. And you realize it's over for him. The American dream is dead. He has made his choice. And then we go into the music and he has become a made man. 
And that use of an off-camera source sound, a train, we never see the train. But it's, uh, it's really the, his brain cells grinding. Can I, should I, will I? And he is, it's screeching. And that is one of the truly great moments of the inner life revealed through sound. Wow. Well said. Well said. I'm going to add The Godfather to my list of uh, films to revisit as well. Thank you for that. And Soren, what say you? <laughs> yeah, well, I love the question. Thank you for that one, because there are so many. But then again, the first that pops up and I will never, ever forget. It is 1984. I am 13 years old. I am in the movie theater watching Beverly Hills Cop, Eddie Murphy. Yeah. And especially, especially the, the scene with the cigarette truck. And as soon as it starts with uh, the Neutron Dance, Oisin, the Pointer Sisters, uh, that was a great hit song already at the time, but how they have embedded that into the film. And the whole scene of that truck smashing through Detroit in real time, I love it. And as soon as I was reading that question, it pops up. Of course, I can be, ah, yeah, well, we can also talk about maybe uh, out of Africa and we can talk there are many, many, many great uh, soundtracks. But that one comes immediately to me because that experience sitting there in that movie theater and that fantastic audio was just simply just, I'll never forget it. Oh. Then we can go to many other films and Top Gun intro, the first one and so forth. Yes, that will be my choice. Phenomenal. This wonderful evening. Yeah, yes. New from Dance, <laughs> Pointer Sisters. Yeah. I was thinking of, uh, you know, the, the, the Beverly Hills Cup movie, again, talking about uh, the streaming services and so forth. It annoys me a bit that uh, that, that thing, there's a, a new Beverly Hills Cup movie coming in 2024 uh, with actually the original cast. And unfortunately, it will not be a cinema movie. It will be launching at one of the big uh, streaming platforms instead. And that is... Uh, that's something that is, what a shame, it should be in the movies, because uh, with all the technology today, I think it could be a funny blast. Listen, I would love for the movie theaters to come back in force, and I welcome going out to the movie theaters. I think it behooves the movie theater owners to improve the experience, because you do like to go out. Yes. And it is still the most democratically cheapest form of major entertainment. I mean, you have to commit to hundreds or if not thousands of dollars to go to a rock concert or a great sports event. Mm. To go to a yes. movie theater is only, you know, a little bit of money. And if you have children, of course, you have to carefully consider how many tickets you're going to get for the kids. It's nowhere near the commitment to any other entertainment experience. No. So I think if we can get us back to the movie theater in a, again, it behooves the owners to come back and say, True. we hear you, we want to make it better. Mm -hmm. I do want to add one film uh, to this story, and that is The Elephant Man, which was really the breakthrough film for me. And The Elephant Man is remarkable because it's based on the true story of a man, John Merrick, is actually Joseph Merrick, back in the late 1800s, who was born with this horrible disfigurement. And to put an ugly person on screen for almost two hours, you know, screen, big screen experience, are you going to want to look at this person? And what David Lynch did so brilliantly with uh, his sound designer, Alan Splett, was he created a sound design of, this was the beginning in Victorian England of the machine age. So you hear this absolutely excruciating sound design of machine and uh, people working and heavy labor and it's clocks ticking and it's just extraordinarily painful. And what you're experiencing is the pain of being the elephant man. And once the elephant man finally reveals his full face and realizes he has safe harbor in the attic of this hospital, he begins to flower and he takes out of the trash some wood and, and products. And at that moment, uh, David Lynch plays, has playing Samuel Barber's Adagio. Wow. And it is an exquisite awakening of the human spirit. And we go from this harsh, mechanic, even brutal sound design to Barber, Samuel Barber's Adagio. And that is the opening of the beauty that is inner beauty of an elephant man opening up and becoming the full man of dignity that he was. And he dignified everyone else. He made wow. them better people. 
So what was interesting is David Lynch, we interviewed him. He said that he heard a specific recording on the radio in London. It might have been a live performance of Samuel Barber's Adagio. And it so moved him. He said, I want that in my movie. And so they, you know, his sound department went out and, and they bought every recording of, you know, Barber's Adagio, brought it in. He kept saying, no, 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 that's not it. That's not it. And they finally went back to the radio and said, on this day, at that time, what were you playing? Because he wanted that precise recording. That was how important it was to him. And so that, so the interesting thing about sound is sound lives in a fourth dimension. It lives in time. You can take a picture of a photograph, but you can't take a picture of sound. Sound is living. And once people are living inside the world of sound, they are experiencing life at a totally different level. And that's what I think is immersion sound experience is what we're now just beginning to discover. That is amazing. I got goosebumps listening to that. Fantastic. Magnificent stuff. Thank you so much. And I'm going to take a slightly different angle and share two of my favourite soundtrack albums. First up, Rumblefish by Stuart Copeland and Friends. And secondly, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence by Ryuiki Sakamoto. I have both on vinyl from back in the day, thanks to my wonderful mum and dad. And I've played them to bits uh, until this day. They're both beautiful. Okay, so there you have it, folks. Cinema sound made consumer sound and consumer love for great audio experiences everywhere made cinema sound again what it is today. Thanks to the pioneering work of some fearless creative mavericks. And yes, you can get epic immersive silver screen sonics at home with the latest JBL soundbars. But cinema itself is a unique and irreplaceable human experience. So let's remember to support our local movie theatres as well. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Bobette Buster. I've had an absolutely wonderful time. It's been a great experience. Thank you for having me on. Amazing, thank you. And Søren Myland. It has been fantastic. A great talk. Loved it. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you, Søren. And uh, folks, please note that Making Waves will be enjoying its broadcast premiere as of May the 4th on PBS in the United States and will be available on PBS Passport Streaming as well as Amazon and through the website makingwavesmovie.com. May the 4th be with you. We will, of course, be linking to makingwavesmovie.com in the show notes and also to Bobette Buster, which is definitely worth a visit. And finally, we will definitely be having a link to those epic JBL soundbars in the show notes as well. Do check them out. So folks at home, don't forget to subscribe, comment and share audio talks with your friends, colleagues and family. If you're enjoying the audio talk series of podcasts, why not pop over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your favourite podcasts and leave a nice review. It really does mean a lot to us and it helps new listeners get to know about the epic guests we talk to in every episode like Bobette and Søren. In the meantime, for more exclusive content, some behind the scenes goodies and maybe even some competitions do connect with us over on the instagram you can find us at audio talks podcast we'll be back soon for some more cinematic audio talks see you next time